Like most rivers in Britain, the Calder starts off in one of the most desolate environments in the country, the moorlands. In this case, Heald Moor, in the Pennine Hills, on the border of Yorkshire and Lancashire. There aren't actually that many rivers in the UK which start off in dramatic style, tumbling out of beautiful rocky mountainsides. More often than not, their source is a big soggy mass like this. These areas are often clouded in damp and gloom. The altitude here is about 400 metres. Temperature and sunshine figures are low. And just over there is the crest of the Pennine Hills, which catch the full force of depressions moving in from the Atlantic. If you live in lowland Britain, you may have no idea of just how extensive these upland areas are. In the UK as a whole, one estimate says that the moorland environment covers approximately 20% of the country. With annual rainfall approaching 1,200mm, these bogs never dry out. They soak up water like a sponge. For well over half the year, the moorland sponge is unable to hold on to the huge amounts of water that fall on them. It lets it go via a network of trickles and rivulets that eventually combine to become what's recognisable as a stream. This section of the video was shot in late September, following one of the hottest summers on record. The UK was experiencing significant drought conditions, and yet you can still see water being released by the moorland, entering the small stream that is the beginning of the River Calder. At this altitude, just a few hundred metres downstream from the soggy moorland summit, the Calder is still a very narrow stream, but it is already starting to cut a V-shaped valley at certain spots, and it's capable of carrying quite a lot of sediment, the material that it has forced out of the land surface on its way down. The sediment carried by a river is usually divided into three different types. Firstly, the solute load. That's the material that has been chemically dissolved into the water. Second, the suspended load. Those are the minute particles that are carried along by the river and often give the water a murky look. Thirdly, the bed load. That's the larger material bounced by saltation and rolled along by traction. The load size is large and angular here. Hydraulic action and abrasion lead to vertical erosion and the valley has steep sides as a result. It is in this section of the river that we can observe interlocking spurs, a series of ridges projecting out on alternate sides of a valley around which a river winds its course. If there are areas of hard rock which are harder to erode, the river will bend around it. It is not powerful enough to cut through the spurs and so has to flow around them. The altitude of the stream decreases dramatically in the river's upper section. The new river is passing over and through different bands of rock, some harder than others. It is in these circumstances that we may see waterfalls forming. Layers of harder rocks erode less quickly. Softer rock below may erode faster. A plunge pool may form below the harder rock, undercutting it until it collapses. The waterfall will retreat, leaving another river feature, a gorge. As the altitude of the river drops, the wild moorland environment begins to peter out and more and more space is taken up by farmland. At this altitude practically all of it is pasture, used to raise cattle and sheep. Less than two kilometres from its source on Heald Moor, in the top left of our picture, the first artificial things in the landscape are reached. The new river first passes under an A-road and then runs up to the Todmorden to Manchester Railway. Engineers in the 1840s recognised the easiest route for the new railway was to follow the path of the river. In fact, so closely, they even altered its course. 
As we continue further downstream, the competition for space is more and more apparent at the base of the steep valley sides. Industrialists harness the power of the water to drive mills. Water from the river was used in many industrial processes. Engineers took advantage of the valley bottom to push through road and rail links. Terraced houses were built for the workers, and the river is often confined within walled banks. At the foot of the main upland section we reach the market town of Todmorden, a settlement that was renowned for its mills, mostly cotton, spinning and weaving. The calder is still moving quickly, and now it is joined by the first of its major tributaries, as Walsden water emerges from a tunnel under the town centre to meet up. The calder is now really up and running, with high levels of erosive energy. Already there is nothing sharp left in the river. Every piece of the bedload has had its corners knocked off, smoothed and rounded by processes such as attrition. It's in this section that erosion is at its most powerful. In times of heavy or prolonged rainfall, water rushes from upland streams to join the river and there is always the concern of flooding. It is a worry that is never far away as the river passes through the industrial towns and villages of Hebden Bridge, Sarby Bridge and Mythamroyd. Settlements squeeze into the narrow valley bottoms. Steep hills surround the river on each side, but soon it will open out. Join us in the next video when we will see the river Calder move into the middle course.